Hi, I'm Mark Smith, also known as Smitty Halibut, KR6ZY, uh, and this is my talk on audio building blocks for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo 2020. I got a lot of slides, so let's get right into it. Um, so who am I? Well, my name is Mark Smith. My call sign is KR6ZY. I'm also known as Smitty Halibut on the internet in various different places like Twitter and YouTube and whatnot. I've been a ham since high school in 1992. I joined the college club W6BHZ for the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club when I went to college in 1993 and that defined about half of my social life all the way through college until 1999. I've been active on APRS, Whisper, local repeaters, I try to do field day when I can uh, and I got really into national parks on the air back in 2016. Uh, I've done several appearances on the Ham Radio Workbench podcast and I have an accidental YouTube channel which is a story for another time. But what do I know? Why am I here? Well, I tend to be a jack of all trades and kind of a master of none, which is a fancy way of saying that I know enough about a lot of different things to know how much I don't actually know about those things. Uh, my day job, <coughs> excuse me, is as a Unix systems administrator and an IP network engineer uh, with some programming and scripting involved in there too. My hobbies are electrical engineering, audio, music, and ham radio, obviously. Uh, so what's this talk about? Well, a lot of ham radio uh, DIY projects have to do with RF. You know, QRP radio kits, antennas, feed line, that kind of thing. But fewer of them talk about audio and assume that we're just using the default speaker and microphone on the radio and aren't doing anything exciting. But what if the default speaker and microphone aren't ideal for your particular use case? How can we improve this? Let me give you an example. So when I got into FM satellite work, uh, I was thinking about the hardware I wanted to use. And obviously, you've got a radio. Um, and you know, you've got an antenna over on in one hand and the radio on the other hand. You've got to twiddle the knob to be able to change the frequency as the Doppler shift change, changes going overhead. So you can't have a speaker mic in your hand, your third hand, for that. So you get a headset, right? You, know, you have headphones and a microphone on your head. And there's one less thing you have to hold in your hand. That's good. Uh, but you still need to do push to talk. And I was thinking of like putting a button on the handle of the antenna itself that I've got hold, held in my hand. Um, but it, you can't really write down your contacts as you go. So a common thing to do is to record all of your contacts, all of the audio um, from the pass, and, and then you know do the actual logging after the fact. Well, I've got a headset, a microphone, I've got audio coming from the radio, uh, I've got the push to talk which has to go in through the same connector as the headset has to go to. So really it would be ideal if I had a box in the middle that I could connect all of these things to and have it do all of the audio routing and everything else to get things where we want to go. And so we're going to use this as kind of the building blocks of, or excuse me, uh, as a um, uh, uh, example project uh, for uh, using all of these building blocks that I'm going to explain. So first, a disclaimer about this talk. I'm going to be treating these building blocks as, building blocks as opaque boxes. I'm not. I'm, we're going to be talking about what the inputs and the outputs are and what happens in the middle, but we're not going to talk about how it does what it does in the middle. We just don't have enough time to get into that kind of details. So I'm going to do lots of hand waving and I promise you there will be no math, right? It was my understanding that there would be no math. So let's get into it. Audio building blocks. What are the audio building blocks that we're gonna be doing today? Well, first we need to talk about audio signal levels um, because a lot of the building blocks have to do with converting between those levels. Then we need to be able to combine certain signals in certain ways and we may wanna select which parts of a signal we want to pass through and which parts we want to block. So let's start out by talking about audio signal levels. All right, in the audio signal levels, a lot of what we're going to be talking about are the voltage and the impedance of those signals. There are also currents involved, and yes, you can use Ohm's law, but I promised you there would be no math. So I'm not going to make you do any Ohm's law on this. But between voltage and impedance, you can figure out the current and therefore the power. Lots of math, hand wavy stuff. I'm going to be hand waving my, my way through this a lot. There are four main categories of levels that we're going to talk about. Uh, the first one is mic level. And obviously, there are lots of different types of mics, and they all have different, uh, different voltages and different impedances even. I'm going to concentrate primarily on electric. 
because that is the kind of the most common microphone style uh, for amateur radio. Uh, and electric mics tend to, the microphone levels tend to be very weak, uh, only like 10 millivolts on that order of magnitude and into like a 2.2K ohm impedance, which is a pretty high impedance as we'll see. The next level up is line level where we've in increased the voltage and decreased the impedance. And the impedance, you know, the volt voltage for a line level signal is about one volt peak to peak. And the impedance is down to about 600 ohms. The next one up is headphone level, which you'll note is about the same voltage as line level. And we'll get to that in a second. But the primary difference is that the impedance is lower. And again, hand waving at the math, but Ohm's law means that if you've got the same voltage into a lower impedance, what you're doing is you're going to be pulling more current and therefore more power overall. So headphone level and line level are very similar, except that the headphones push more power for the same signal. Uh, and then the fourth category is speaker level. Speaker levels, I put about 10 volts here. It's wildly varying depending on the use case. Um, some speaker levels are not much more than headphone levels, but some speaker levels are a lot more than headphone levels. Um, for what we're talking about here, it's going to be in the range from like 2 to 10 volts for uh, amateur radio projects. Uh, and, but the, again, the important part here is that the impedances are much lower. So those are the four signal levels we're going to be dealing with here. Um, mic level, line level, headphone level, and speaker level. The next thing we're going to talk about is converting between these levels. All right, so let's convert some signals between these levels. There are two main categories. Sometimes we might want to make a signal bigger, and we use an amplifier to do that. So to kind of move down that table, right, to go from a weaker signal to a stronger signal, we'll use an amplifier to do that. And that's in a block diagram, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about here. That's what amplifiers look like, right? You, um, you may have seen a, an op amplifier, an operational amplifier or an op amp in a circuit diagram. It's a triangle. When you see a triangle with an input and an output, that means it's an amplifier. Attenuators are the opposite of amplifiers. They make signals smaller. They, they bring you back up that, um, that table that we showed earlier. And attenuators come in many shapes and sizes, but the ones that we're primarily going to be dealing with here are voltage dividers. And again, I promised no Ohm's law, no math or anything like that, but you can go look up what a voltage divider does, and it just basically takes a larger voltage and uh, shrinks it and you know divides it down by a certain, uh, certain amount, depending on the value of those resistors. <clears throat> so let's take a little closer look at amplifiers. There's the block diagram of the amplifier that I told you about, but an operational amplifier is one that you're going to see in a circuit more often. And it looks very similar, but it's got that little plus and minus on the input sides. Um, what I'm not showing here are the feedback because it depends on how you configure the op amps. We are not going to go into details of op amps in this talk. I just don't have the time for it. But you'll see operational amplifiers in your circuits. And when you see one, chances are it is making a small signal bigger. So let's look a little bit at attenuators. Like I showed you, the uh, the two resistors in a configuration like that, a fixed resistor is going to be a fixed uh, fixed attenuator, and they call those pads. A fixed attenuator is called a pad, and they look kind of like that, or at least for audio. When you're doing RF, you need to worry about impedance matching on both sides, and so they look differently. But this is the way we're going to be doing it when we're dealing with audio. There's a special case for an attenuator called a volume control. You all have heard of volume controls. We've got knobs on things and whatnot. It's, it's using a potentiometer. And a potentiometer is basically a attenuator where you get to vary how much resistance is on the top and the bottom. The total sum of the two is fixed. But what you're doing is you're moving that tap to be somewhere near the top where you have zero ohms on the top and all of it on the bottom, or you can move it to a half ways where you got about half and half, or you can move it all the way down where you have all the impedance on the top and zero down at the bottom or anywhere in between. And it's a volume control. It's basically a variable attenuator. Uh, all right, so to convert between these different levels, we use amplifiers and attenuators. We'll be using those a lot. All right, combining signals. How do we combine signals together? Before we do that, Let's take a quick detour and look at splitting signals and why I don't bother making a, um, uh, a building block out of a splitter. So let's take a look at a, um, you know, here's a signal. We got a signal going into an amplifier and into a load. We're just going to use a resistor as a load. If I want to send that to a second load, 
all it is is two resistors in parallel. The load looks like a resistor. And two resistors in parallel is still a resistor. It's a slightly lower impedance resistor. Um, so you, you can't just split signals indefinitely. You need to make sure that whatever is driving those signals is able to handle the combined impedance of all of those loads. But you don't need a device. You don't need a block to do that. Um, so I'm not going to bother defining a block for uh, for splitting signals. We're just going to um, we're just going to have you know an output of an amplifier in this case and just drive it to both of the loads. That's why we're not bothering with splitting. All right, so let's get back to combining. Combining you can't do that. You can't have multiple sources go into a single. Uh, load on a source. You can't do that without having something to combine them. So what kind of things can we use to combine them? Well, the simplest way to do it is to use a switch. With a switch, you have multiple inputs and you just select one at a time. And you have one input at any given time, you have one input going to one output. And you just get to choose which one uh, you have going. And that's great until you need to be able to get multiple signals going to the output at the same time. And to do that, we use what's called a mixer. And a mixer looks an awful lot like an amplifier, and there's a good reason for that, but that's one of those things that gets into technical details that we're not going to do today. But you have multiple inputs, and it sums them together and sends them out to the output. I hear you saying, that's not a mixer, that's a mixer. Uh, well, sort of. When I'm talking about mixers here, I'm not talking about this kind of mixer. This kind of mixer is what's called a product mixer, where you are literally multiplying the two values together. Uh, so let's say you had a one volt signal and a two volt signal. The output would be, um, would be two volts because one times two is two volts. Uh, whereas in our summing mixer, if you had one input that was one volt and one input that was two volts, the output would be three volts. It's literally the sum of the two input voltages. And when, we, when we're dealing with audio, we're, do, we're dealing with summing mixers. Yes, you can get into modulators and other things that are, do some neat effects. We're not going to be dealing with that in uh, amateur radio. That's mostly a music thing, kind of an effects thing. All right, so combining signals. Um, we use switches if you only want one signal at a time, or mixers if you want to be able to combine multiple signals at the same time to a output. All right, <clears throat> so the next step is we, we need a way of being able to select which parts of a signal. We want to be able to pass some things from, you know, let some part of the audio go through, but block other parts of the audio. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's say we wanted to pass only the high frequencies, but block low frequencies. So one way to do that is with a capacitor. And here we're not going to be doing block diagrams. We're actually going to use components, but I promise you there will be no math. I'm lying to you. Block for, so a capacitor in series with your signal will block low frequencies but allow high frequencies to go through. And how do I remember this? Well, let's look at the ultimate low frequency is zero hertz, right? DC is a zero hertz signal. That is the ultimate in low frequencies. Look at this capacitor. There's no way for a DC signal to make it through that capacitor because they're just disconnected right so that's the way i think of um trying to remember whether a capacitor is a high pass or a low pass component think about dc going through that that component uh, as opposed to an inductor which we'll get to in a bit so one way to only pass high frequencies is to block all of the low frequencies from going through the other way to do it is to shunt the low frequencies to ground and again think of the uh, this inductor here if there's a, uh, an impedance on the output, the inductor is going to look like uh, zero ohms, a zero ohm impedance to lower frequencies, but it'll look like a higher impedance to higher frequencies, and so the output will take most of those. But the point, be, point here is that um, you can either put something in series to block the other frequencies, or you can put it to ground and shunt those other frequencies. All right, so this is how you do it as a high-pass filter. Let's take a look at low-pass filters exactly the same but with all the components reversed block high frequencies look at an inductor an inductor is just a piece of wire if you're not concerned about AC look at the zero Hertz signal a DC signal a DC signal will pass right through a coil right because there's no there's no reactant so think of a coil as a low pass 
component and it'll block the high frequencies. That's how I remember which one is which. Uh, but so back to the to the filter, uh, the blocking the high frequencies with a series inductor, or we can shunt the high frequencies to ground uh, with a capacitor to ground. Right. So it's the exact same thing here, but all of the highs and lows are reversed, and the components that we're using to do it are reversed. Inductors are hard. A lot of people don't like winding inductors. In reality, in audio with the impedances and the uh, frequencies that we're talking about, inductors tend to be very big. Um, so we try not to use them. Capacitors are a lot, easy, lot easier to use when doing audio. They also tend to be much more precise, and so you can calculate their cutoff frequencies a lot better. So consequently, we're going to use the capacitor versions of both of these. So if we want to have a high-pass filter in audio, we are going to use a series capacitor. Whereas if we want a low-pass filter at audio, we're generally going to put a capacitor to ground. And that will roll off all the high frequencies. Um, yeah, so how do you calculate what frequencies those things are going to be? Well, there's this handy little equation. F equals 1 over... It was my understanding there would be no math. Okay, fine. Get out of here, Chevy. It's a frequency. We're not going to do any math in this thing, but know that this equation exists. Um, this is kind of the Ohm's law or the power law version for calculating filters. 1 over 2 pi RC is a, frequent, is a function that I use all the time. We're not going to go into how to use it, but the frequency of the cutoff, either the high pass cutoff or the low pass cutoff, is calculated using that function. Right, and so, but when you when you're looking at the out, output side, the R in this case is the impedance of the output. It's actually the combined impedance of your inputs and your outputs. But we assume that the input impedance is a lot lower than the output, and that the dominant um, uh, the dominant uh, impedance is defined by the output. So in this particular case, um, you know, for a, what is this? This is a high shunt, so this, so this this is a low pass filter. This low pass filter here will shunt off all the high frequencies and where that cuts off is defined by the value of that capacitor and that resistor using that function. Same thing here, where this low pass is gonna cut, excuse me, high pass is gonna cut off is defined by the value of this capacitor and this resistor using that function. All right, that's the only math, I promise. So one special case of uh, filters is called isolation. So a lot of times, or, or not necessarily a special case, but a use of this, a lot of times um, signals will come in and it will have a DC voltage combined with that audio. So instead of having that audio being up and down above ground, maybe it'll be up and down above 5 volts or something else. And there are various different reasons you might want to do that. The point is that you have to be able to deal with that, and the way you deal with that is by sticking a capacitor in series. Again, DC, 0 hertz, it's the ultimate low frequency. So if you put a big enough capacitor there, it'll pass, and big enough is defined by the value of that capacitor and that res load resistor, it'll pass all of the high frequencies, all of the audio frequencies that you want, but it'll block DC. So you set that cutoff frequency to be below all of the audio frequencies you want, but above DC. I mean, you can't, you would need to have an infinite capacitor there to pass DC. You can't have an infinite capacitor, so it'll be somewhere in there. So that's one common way to do it, but it only works if you have a shared ground um, or if you don't mind connecting the grounds. There are times when you don't have a shared ground or possibly the input signal isn't actually ground referenced. A lot of times speakers are balanced signals or they're built with a push-pull amplifier where both sides of the speaker are driven. You've got one signal going up and the other signal going down and then they kind of oscillate around each other like this and it's a way of getting more power out of the same voltage of your power supply. It's, it's a way of making a speaker, uh, speaker amplifier more powerful without having to switch up your power supply voltages and whatnot. But it means that your speaker is not ground referenced. So you can't just connect it into a signal that is thinking, that is expecting the signal to be ground referenced. So we use what are called audio transformers. Okay, um, and so the signal comes in and goes around, and it induces a signal on the other side, and we can ground the other side. It's a way of isolating these things. Because there's no DC connection between the left side and the right side, you can actually have big voltages. DC different you know differences in your grounds between those two sides. This is why a lot of um, 
uh, like computer interfaces to radios have transformers in them to isolate them to get that um, get that uh, uh, de ground connection out of there get, disconnect that ground it also is a way of preventing ground loops which if you've ever had uh, noise in your shack RF noise in your shack ground loops can be a real problem so isolation is kind of another form of a filter because these are again these are both high pass filters that we're using them for we're blocking the DC that's coming in well I guess inductors are useful after all all right so selecting parts of the signals filters and isolation right we just talked about those all right so let's summarize what we've talked about we got the different audio signal levels microphone line headphone and speaker we've learned how to convert signals between those levels using amplifiers and attenuators We've learned how to combine signals, multiple signals, into a single uh, destination, either using switches, one at a time, or mixers, all of them at the same time. Uh, and then we've figured out how to select different parts of the signal that we want to pass, either the high frequencies or the low frequencies. And kind of one instance of that is to isolate out the ground from one side to the other. All right. So those are all the building blocks that we're talking about today. Let's put it all together. Let's bring back that example that I talked about earlier of the FM satellite, uh, that box in the middle there. And let's start designing that box using these, uh, these building blocks. Um, here I just talked about the different signals, right? The radio has audio coming out of the radio and a mic going into the radio plus a PTT. The headset has audio coming in from the mic and audio going out to the headset. The recorder has um, uh, audio going into it and we want the, radio fr the audio from the radio and the audio from the microphone mixed together, summed together to go to the recorder. So the recorder can hear both the radio side and the operator side. Similarly, in the headset, we want to be able to hear the audio from the radio, but also the playback from the recorder so that we don't have to move things around and try and listen to it through the headphones or whatever. I'd love to be able to get audio from the recorder into the headset as well. So we got a couple of mixers that we're going to do in here as well. All right, so let's design this circuit, and we're going to do it mostly at the block level diagram. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start out with some connectors. We've got a uh, output to the radio microphone, and we've got an input from the radio speaker. So there are the two connectors going to the radio. And then in from the headset mic and out to the headset headphones. So those are the two connectors to the headset itself. We're just going to start with those connectors. Well, let's do the easy one first. The headset mic can go straight out to the radio mic. Um, the radio mic does uh, the the radio um, does some things with the electric. You have to drive it with a DC bias voltage. Again, hand wave. There's a lot of things that I'm hand waving at here. Um, we're just going to let the radio do that directly and connect it directly to the microphone. Uh, we also add the PTT switch here because that has to go in on the same connector as the radio mic. I'm hand waving a lot at the way the PTT signal gets sent in. Just assume it's there. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the output from the radio and we're going to send it out to the headset headphones. Um, but we are not sure that the radio speaker output is ground referenced. So in fact, a lot of radio speakers are not. Um, HTs typically are, but like if you have um, a more powerful radio, a bigger radio with a more powerful speaker output, it's not. So we're going to transform or isolate that to make sure that whatever that minus side of that speaker, if it's not ground, we're going to make it groundable on this side of the transformer. So that's performing our isolation. But this is speaker level. And when we do mixers, mixers are best done at line level for reasons I won't get into right here. So we need to pad down the output of the speaker level to line level. And so we're going to put a pad our fixed resistor uh, voltage divider on the output of the isolation transformer. And then this coming out here is a line level signal that goes into the mixer. But the output of the mixer is going to headphones. And line level is 600 ohms, and headphones are around 16 ohms. So we need to amplify that signal back up. It's the same voltage, but it's a different impedance. And it, and it won't be able to drive a high impedance source will not be able to drive a low impedance load. So we need to put an amplifier there to go back, I guess, down the table and more powerful signal from a line level signal to a headphone level signal out to the headphones. And the mixer's there because we're going to add something to it in a second. Well, let's go do that right now. So here's the here are the connectors for the recorder. You know, input from the recorder headphones and then output to the recorder mic. 
All right, well, the easy one to hook up here is that connection right there from the recorder headphones into the mixer. Now, notice that I didn't pad this down because the mixer input is a high impedance, but the headphone output is a low impedance, and a lower impedance can drive a high impedance source no problem. It's a high impedance um, source. I think I screwed that up. A low impedance source can drive a high impedance load just fine. A high impedance source cannot drive a low impedance load because it'll, it, it draws more power than that uh, source is able to, to provide. Uh, but if it's able to provide a whole lot of power and we're only pulling a little bit of it, that's fine. So I didn't bother padding out the headphones because they're about the same voltage levels already. Um, so we just take the recorder headphones output and send it directly into one of the inputs on the mixer. So now the output, output to your headset headphones is a combination. It is the sum of the audio from the radio speaker and from the recorder headphone output, right? So now in my headphones, I can hear both the radio and the playback from the recorder at the same time. That's pretty cool. So let's do the other side of this as well. From the radio speaker, uh, I'm going to take this same output here and I'm going to send it into another mixer, a second mixer. But this one is going to a microphone level input on the recorder. The recorder is expecting a microphone level input. So we do need to pad that line level down to mic level. So we've taken the roughly one volt and padded it down to about 10 millivolts. And then from there, it goes straight into the recorder microphone input. What's the other input that we want to go to the recorder? Well, it's we want to get a copy of the headset mic. So we have that headset mic. Now remember, that microphone input has a DC bias voltage on it because it's an electric microphone and we can't send that into the mixer so we want to block that DC so we put a DC blocking cap right there now having said that this is also a microphone level signal but our mixer is a line level signal so I'm gonna put an amplifier at the front end of it so I've come in and I've blocked the DC and I'm passing only the AC in here and then I take that signal and I'll amplify it from that 10 millivolts up to 1 volt line level, mix it in with this other line level signal here, and the output of that is a line level signal which we then need to drop back down to mic level. An alternate way of doing this would be to design a mixer that works at mic level and to, and to pad it from here so that the output of this is mic level and you just mix the two mic level signals directly into the output. That would have been another way of doing it, but I decided to do it this way. That's pretty much it, right? So let's look at our outputs. The recorder, the input to the reporter, recorder is getting a sum of the headset microphone and the radio speaker output. Both of those get mixed together and sent into the recorder. My headset is getting a sum of the recorder output and the radio speaker. The radio microphone is only getting the headset microphone because I don't ever want to send audio from the recorder or anything else in there. And then the PTT is sent through. And so this is an example of how we can use just these simple building blocks in a somewhat complex way to make a much more complex component with all these different inputs and outputs the way we want that audio routed. And, and we can build this using, using these building blocks. Things I haven't covered. All right, I've waved my hands at an awful lot. Most notably, I haven't even talked about power supplies at all. Whether we're using a uh, you know ground to 12 volt power supply or whether we have a plus and minus power supply, things like that. Where are we getting power from this? If you don't have plus and minus voltage supplies, but you've got a lot of ground reference signals, you need to create a false ground. I haven't gone into that at all. Again, hand waving. I haven't talked about the design of amplifiers or mixers. Op amps are a talk unto themselves. If we want to get into that, that's going to be another 30 minutes. And I haven't talked at all about RF suppression. We're, talking, we're working in an RF environment and we've got amplifiers in here. If RF gets into the wrong place, those amplifiers will turn into oscillators and nobody wants that. Uh, that causes all kinds of problems. So there are things that we do uh, at the inputs and outputs to suppress RF getting into, the, into there. 
that's pretty much it. How do you get a hold of me? Well, primarily on Twitter. I am Smitty Halibut on Twitter. I'm also on YouTube, also Smitty Halibut, since a pattern forming here. Um, for ham radio stuff, uh, you can get me on Slack. Uh, my local club, CQ805, uh, is primarily targeted toward the San Luis Obispo, California area, but we have members from all over the place, and you're absolutely welcome to join. You can get more information there on the, on the CQ805.radio website. Uh, and that's it. Q&A. Thank you very much for coming to my talk, and I'll stick around and answer any questions you may have.